Five Country close up for baby. December fourth. Was there uh, any note or any information left on the child? Yes, there was a note with the child. It said, I need a, I need a family. Please help me. To be able to communicate means a lot. In my work in California as a watch commander in the prison system, it's 95% of my job. I'm having about $200 worth of work done on my car that two years ago I wouldn't do. I would trade and get a newer car, but the prices of new cars today are just out of, out of sight. It's cheaper to fix than it is to buy new anymore. That's one of the things that toys should be for children is fun. Uh, and something should be able to happen with the toys that they have. Even if it's a doll that you rock, I mean, it gives you some kind of satisfaction. I'm Twyla Young. I'm Bob Pyle. A visit to a toy shop and a look at inflation, what it is and why it has us in its grip. Also a controversial operation that's helping some people talk again. But first a look at a problem that's cropped up in central Iowa a couple of times in the last few weeks. Bob? Last October, a baby girl was abandoned at a Des Moines hospital. And just eight days ago, a baby boy was abandoned on the steps of Mary Greeley Hospital in Ames. Since the Ames abandonment, joint effort to locate the boy's parents has been launched by local authorities and the Story County Social Services Office. Tonight we look at the case and just what the future might hold for the boy. Monday night, November 26, a woman walks the streets of Ames with a cardboard box. She takes care not to be seen as she approaches the emergency entrance to Mary Greeley Hospital. She walks towards the door as if to enter, but then she stops just short of the door sits the box down, and runs away. This is how it might have been that cold November night just eight days ago, when an infant was left on the doorstep of the hospital. The baby was discovered by an ambulance driver around 845, apparently in good health. The child was wrapped in a blanket and in a cardboard box. Pinned to the blanket was a note. It read simply, I need a family, please help me. It also gave the birth date, November 25th. That's not much to go on, according to hospital officials, but they're making the best of it. They've given the child a name, Mark, and he's getting the best of care. It's like caring for any normal child. It's under the care of our medical staff. Dr. Swanson is the pediatrician that is caring for the child. It, it's a lovely baby, and I think the nursing staff will always be very attached to something, uh, to, to a baby like that. Mark's case was somewhat unusual here in the state, but not unique. Last October, another child was left at the admitting desk at Iowa Methodist Hospital in Des Moines with a similar note attached. The abandoned infant was nicknamed Tiffany Marie and is currently in a Polk County foster home. And that soon could be Mark's fate. Story County Social Services Director Sandra Taylor says that any day now, the infant will probably be placed in the care of a foster family. We've not yet uh, located a, a foster home among those people that we have here in Story County um, that will take the child, but we are working on that and don't see that finding a foster home is going to be a problem for him. Taylor's office hasn't heard anything on the parents' whereabouts yet, but her office has been flooded with calls from people who want to adopt the baby. Department of Social Services, Sandra Taylor. We have also yes. filed a termination of parental rights petition, and there's going to be a hearing in December that will look at the evidence to decide if the child has really been abandoned. Now, there would be some things that could change that in the interim if the parents or someone having knowledge of the parents would come forward. Sandra, what does it mean to sever parental rights? That means that um, your child becomes a stranger to you. You no longer have a right to know anything about that child, where that child is, um, how he's doing, no right to visit, no right to know anything about that child. It's a very drastic measure. Taylor says that might sound harsh, but she says, what else can the state do? Unless the parents come forward, the only other thing to do is to put the baby up for adoption. After Mark was found, the job of finding the child's parents was placed in the hands of the Ames police. Well, this is a very difficult case uh, uh, to uh, determine uh, the identity of the baby. Seidelman says his department does have some idea to the type of person it's looking for. Oh, I think in this case, uh, it's probably an individual that may or may not be married, uh, probably does not have any money or very little money, uh, probably doesn't have a great deal of uh, hope 
for the future of the child. I have a strong feeling of compassion for this person. It, the way that the, the baby was left with a note attached to it saying, you know, care for me, find me a good home, um, indicates that whoever left the baby had the baby's best interest at heart. So I think the, the mother uh, obviously intended for the baby to be found uh, from where it was left. So I don't think she was interested in the baby uh, coming to any harm in any way. Since Mark was left in a location where he could easily be found and cared for, the Story County Attorney's Office reports it probably will not press charges of child abuse against the parents. But officials would like to locate the family, and to do that, the chief says they need the public's help. Someone must know who the mother of this child is. Uh, has been aware that uh, there was a pregnancy involved here and that that pregnancy is terminated one way or the other. The Department of Social Services likes to see families be able to stay together. And if the mother is thinking that she would like to have the child, would like to be able to keep the child with her, the Department of Social Services would like to be able to help her do that. So we'd like to be able to talk to the mother to make sure that this is really what she wants to do. Bob, suppose the parents, uh, of, or one of the parents of the baby, come forward, but they really don't want to keep the child. What happens next? Twyla Taylor told me that uh, if the parents really don't want the baby, uh, they'll abide by the parent's decision, because they figure that's usually the best decision for both the child and the parent. Okay. Three weeks ago, doctors from across the country gathered at Mercy Hospital in Des Moines to learn more about a medical technique that could dramatically affect the lives of thousands of Americans. In, a, in an amphitheater on screens hooked up to a closed circuit TV system in one of the operating rooms, doctors watched as a Des Moines plastic surgeon performed a minor miracle. He created a voice. Charlene Peroni has more. Dr. James Stallings has been restoring voices with his own special surgical technique for nearly seven years now. And Wayne Livesey is living proof that Stallings' minor miracle is a success. I remember in the recovery room, first thing I remember was Dr. Stallings leaning over me and asking me to count. And I counted to three or four. And then he told me not to say anything else for a few days. I was about six or seven days in intensive care. Then I returned to my room and I was able to speak then. Livesey is only one of 10,000 Americans who every year lose their voice boxes or larynxes to cancer or some other disease. Most of those people are condemned to a life of silence. With no voice box, they're unable to utter a sound, and life often becomes unbearable. To be able to communicate means a lot. In my work in California as a watch commander in the prison system, it's 95% of my job. To be honest, I told my wife that I didn't believe I'd go through with the surgery. Whether I would have fallen through with that or not, I don't know. What would have happened had you not gone through with the surgery? I would have been a terminal case because I was told that if the larynx was not removed, I would die. Speaking through a hole in the throat may seem difficult, but patients say they readily adjust and find it far superior to a technique called esophageal speech, where words literally are burped up, or to the use of electrical devices that create robot-like sounds. Rusty Phillips spent six months without a voice box, and he found the effects of those methods devastating. I used the electric larynx, which um, was very unsatisfactory. People told me they could understand it, you know, and then would later tell my wife that it was practically impossible to hear me over the telephone. And that is another terrible feeling when the telephone rings and you can't answer. What brought you to Dr. Stallings? Uh, my wife has a beauty shop and one of her customers found it in the midnight newspaper in a grocery store just by grace of luck you know that what did the article say that they were restoring the human voice according to stallings his technique is fairly simple basically what he does is to reconstruct the voice box with a bit of rib and create new vocal cords with pieces of tendon the most difficult part of the operation convincing the other doctors that it works I think the medical profession is very conservative by nature, and we have a saying in medicine, never be the first to take up the new or the last to lay aside the old. And I think that this is about the way that doctors in general feel. But it, it will take time before people believe that these procedures do work. As far as Dr. Stallings' uh, 
tendon grafting method is concerned, uh, I think that I shall, uh, I'm quite prepared to use this method on my own patients back in England. I think it's a, a sound, valuable method, and it's what I've been looking for. In spite of Dr. Edwards' acceptance, Stallings knows he has a long way to go before his technique is generally approved by the medical community. Very few doctors in this country will even acknowledge it, much less attempt it. What did your doctor say when you asked for your medical reports? I assume you had to go to your doctor and say, look, I want to send my reports on to uh, another doctor. That is something that all of us patients mm -hmm. discuss. Our doctor does not want to recognize this type of an operation. In fact, I have never talked to my doctor again since I did ask for the papers. What did he say to you? Well, he said nothing to me. In fact, he hung up the phone when we told him well, we were going to return back here and, and uh, go through the operation. That attitude is something Stallings hopes to erase by opening his operating room to anyone who's interested. Of course, that includes doctors, but it also includes potential patients. This operation was made into a media event not so much to let doctors know that this technique exists, but to give patients who may have to face a laryngectomy new hope. I would say at the present time that the majority of people who have a total laryngectomy have no voice restoration at all in the United States. And again, that's because only a handful of us are doing this work. And that just makes me want to redouble my efforts to educate people that these techniques are valid. Mm -hmm. The proof is there. All one has to do is listen and look. What are the limitations, if any? What can't you do now that you could do before? Water, swimming, I love the water. So I just bought a bigger boat and I stay on it and stay in it. I do go in the pool, but I use a large beach ball to float my body higher than normal. This gives my wife heart failure, but I do it. Playing golf, play at a golf ball, I don't yell for like I used to, that's all. Otherwise, no problem. Dr. Stallings gave us a copy of a letter he received from another of his patients. It reads in part, I am more delighted by the results of the operation and will continue to remember this great accomplishment. The accidents or diseases that cause impairments such as mine are tragic, but how much more tragic are those who never recover from the functions necessary for a quality life. Coming up next, Debbie Cutter has a special report for close-up on inflation and how two Iowa families are dealing with it. Inflation is a problem that affects most all Americans today. we felt the pinch of higher fuel bills and bigger fuel costs. At the same time, more people are going deeper into debt. Tonight, in a special report, Debbie Cutter examines the effects of inflation by looking at two Iowa families. Bigger food bills, higher fuel costs, more credit card debt. Most have become a real concern for Americans because of double-digit inflation. But what is inflation? 
Inflation is, is the rise in the general uh, money price level of goods and services. Where stated differently, it's the decline in the real value or the real purchasing power of money. Money is like any other commodity. If its supply increases quite rapidly, its value tends to fall. So when the money supply grows rapidly, the real value of money tends to decline, and that's what inflation's all about. The process Starleaf describes has created a situation in which consumer prices have jumped 101% in just six years. Such a steep increase has created another problem, consumer debt. To keep up with inflation, many of us rely more on credit. So much so that credit card debt has tripled in just 10 years, from $117 billion to $304 billion. This reliance on credit has created a situation where one out of every four dollars of take-home pay now goes to pay debts. There are signs, however, that we may be beginning to tighten our belts. In October, retail sales dipped by nearly 2 percent, the sharpest drop in four and a half years. Home economist Cindy Needles offers an explanation. Well, if we take a look at inflation indices, particularly the consumer price index, we can see that inflation has hit necessities, those areas such as housing, food, energy, and health care. This is causing families to relook at the difference between their needs and their wants. And that choice-making process can be stressful, and it can also result in some conflict in families. The Whitney family in Ames is one family who has had to learn to cope with inflation. Chuck and Marge have three boys. They live in this two-story house along with grandfather Bryce Springer. Mr. Whitney is a machinist at Sunstrand in Ames. With that and his retirement pay from the Marine Corps, he supports his family on about $23,000 a year. In a time of high prices, Chuck says, they make do, but not without sacrifices. For an example, I'm having about $200 worth of work done on my car that two years ago I wouldn't do. I would trade and get a newer car, but the prices of new cars today are just out of, out of sight. It's cheaper to fix than it is to buy new anymore. Marge Whitney is a housewife and church secretary. Even with her extra income, inflation has forced major changes in her family's lifestyle and eating habits. I've started using uh, store brands instead of the name brands. Uh, we discovered a long time ago, a long, long time ago, that uh, a side of beef was cheaper than buying the cuts out of the case. What's different about shopping today than it was years ago? It's not as much fun as it used to be. Uh, especially on payday, we would go out. I would take one of the children or two with me, and I, I would allow them to pick out some of the extras. But uh, there's not too much of that done anymore. Oldest son David is also affected. He owns his own car and feels the pinch of high gas costs. 14-year-old Tom mows lawns to help out. 11-year-old Michael now takes a sack lunch rather than enjoying a school hot lunch. The change in prices has been even more dramatic for grandfather Bryce Springer. I have paid 95 cents for a pair of good sho leather shoes. And here, my last pair of shoes was $44 and something. There's leather the same as they won in them days. The housing market in this country has also greatly been affected by skyrocketing costs, so much so that many families cannot even afford to buy their own home. Steve and Debbie Jones in Des Moines were able to buy this one-story home for $28,000. It was a big investment for them. Steve supports his wife and two young boys, Carl and Justin, on about $15,000 a year as an engineering maintenance worker for Des Moines Water Works. Steve's happy with their decision to buy, but says it has meant sacrifices. We don't go out very much anymore. We stay more to home. Uh, no, uh, no, more, less running around. And uh, we don't visit relatives uh, out of town so much as we used to. What types of things do you do around the house to help you save money? Uh, do my own repair work. Any repairs or anything around here, I do myself. While it means sacrifices for most families, the president of Iowa Savings and Loan, Dennis Montgomery, says investing in a home is important to American consumers. It's, it's part of the great American dream. It's a part of the American ethic, if you will, to be a part of home ownership and they're willing to sacrifice to do this. Uh, they put do they home often buy beyond their limits? I don't want to say beyond their limits, but they're willing to, to give up a, a number of other things to be a part of home ownership. Inflation, as we've seen in the case of Debbie and Steve Jones, puts pressure on a family to make hard choices and sacrifices. Psychologists say those added pressures may affect family relationships. If families can continue to cope with the stress and, and do the budgeting and, and uh, 
make the, make the cuts, they can usually cope pretty well. But it gets to a point where when some families we're seeing, and uh, I think more families, where they cannot do any more budgeting, any more cutting, and it is starting to affect their lifestyles and their way of, of interacting. Weigel says family symptoms brought on by inflation stress can be positive or negative. Some families which are stronger can tolerate more kinds of stress than families which are not as strong. But it gets to a point, no matter how competent that family is, where it does cause some kinds of problems. It's like a threshold. It could be uh, violence, for example, domestic violence. It could be violence directed towards the outside. It may be a breakdown within in the family, such as a divorce or an abandonment, or could be a very drastic change in the lifestyle of the family. In some ways, it's put uh, a closeness, brought the family closer together, uh, because we don't go as much anymore. We're, we're more of a homebody unit now. In other ways, the boys, they fight a little bit more, too, <laughs> because they're kept together more often than they were a while back. With Christmas coming up, a lot of families are going to be feeling the pinch extra hard in the next few months. That's right, Bob. The experts tell us that inflation is going to force a lot of people to buy more necessities and less luxuries for Christmas presents this year. But no matter, Christmas trees everywhere will still have at least some toys under them. It doesn't seem to matter what the general state of the economy, or what's in style, or where you live. Toys of some description always seem to be the favorite Christmas gift. But what kind of toys should you be spending your hard-earned money on? To find out, we thought we'd visit with a toy expert, three-and-a-half-year-old Andy Evenson. Andy has some definite ideas about what he likes and what he doesn't like in toys. And even though Andy probably hasn't given it a great deal of thought, his mother says he needs certain things from his toys. I look for things that he can move with and that he can make change. Um, in other words, his imagination is just so vivid right now that a car may be a car one minute and it may be a dump truck the next minute. A shoebox may be a bolt and may be a garage for the cars. And, you know, it's that kind of toy that I'm always looking for that can do many different things. And that's easy for him to move around to different places in the house. Child development specialist Dorothy Pinsky says that different kinds of toys do different kinds of things for children. Well, one of the standard kinds of things that goes on in childhood from very early on is, is the, the desire to, and it's a developmental process, to build things, to create. And so blocks then obviously become a very logical kind of toy for children at, from very early on. Putting things together, you know, the spool, the, the spools that fit on, on, the, on the rod, for example. Um, manipulative things, having things to touch, chew on if you're an infant, um, throw around, see how they bang, see how they, how they work, put them together, build them. And so building and, and manipulating things. Uh, and of course, that, those kinds of toys become more sophisticated as children's motor development increases. Um, children are always trying to imitate the world that they live in, too, and, and recreate it. And so all the familiar play kinds of toys, the housekeeping toys, the trucks, the vehicles, um, the, the things that, that mommy and daddy use in their, in their work and at home, those kinds of toys also, as children get older, have more and more of a role. Very young children are very interested in imitating the kinds of things that their parents do and the adults that they see doing. In recent years, there has been a great deal of concern about the safety of toys. Largely as a result of that, toy manufacturers now police themselves fairly closely, and many retail outlets examine products themselves for safety. But from time to time, the Consumer Product Safety Commission does find a toy unsafe and recalls it. And Penske says that there are other reasons that consumers still need to be aware of potential danger in toys for youngsters. Parents are still buying toys from a variety of sources, you know, cooperatives, private people, imported toys that may not be getting the strict care that, that they should be. And so I think parents still need, and anyone who's buying toys, parents, child care providers, grandparents, relatives, need to be looking at toys for safety. Uh, some of the kinds of things that you look for in terms of all ages of children are, are sharp edges, things that stick out, things that can come apart too easily that are not supposed to. Wheels that will come off and that may have sharp pins, for example, uh, would be one. Or button eyes that, that uh, in a stuffed animal or a puppet that a child could bite off, as opposed to something that's sewn on um, and, and cannot be swallowed by the child. That's another thing, small, little small pieces. Um, you know, toys with little small pieces that older children use are fine, but if they're small enough for a young child to choke on, then you don't want to have the children playing with those. 
The old standbys like Tinker Toys and good old-fashioned blocks sell every year, all year long. But at Christmas, it's time for fad toys. And this year, it's electronic and computer-run toys that are selling like hotcakes. Toy Fair manager Kevin Warehouser showed us some of this year's big sellers. How do they work and why are they so neat? Well, they work. It's fairly simple. It's kind of strange playing push button follow the leader with a machine, but these kinds of toys have opened up a whole new market. They are not just for kids. Toys for adults, you know, are a relatively new phenomenon. Not games, not things, you know, like golf, and, but actual toys that we can have in our homes and play with our children or with each other, um, family kinds of toys. So those are the kinds of things I enjoy. They are also very expensive. The handheld and table model computer and electronic games can run you as much as $40. But that isn't slowing up the market. Warehouser says he'll probably be able to sell all he can get from his distributor. But even though there's no denying that expensive toys are getting more and more popular, there's also no denying that it's the idea behind a toy, not how much it costs, that makes it fun. Witness, three and a half year old Andy, who will readily desert his chrome and plastic his handmade wooden and mass-produced fancy toys if the spirit moves him. Some things that I'll discard, he might find, and think that would make a neat toy, you know, make something special out of it, like um, a cooking utensil that may not be usable, you know, maybe one end of it is a little bent or something like that, and I'd be discarding it, and he'll find a use for it. He'll, um, he'll choose something that he needs for a particular job that he's doing. Uh, his uh, play is very important to him, and he selects, he selects ways to do things that are special. Box looks mighty good to me sometimes. There have been several reports that electronic toys are going to be in short supply this year, but uh, that's be apparently because toy makers are having trouble getting enough of the silicon chips that they use to make the programmed parts of the toy. But not to worry. Some retailers are having trouble getting uh, as many toys as they would like in stock, but Warehouser thinks that Christmas shoppers will be able to pretty much find what they want if they just look hard enough. Last close-up for this uh, evening. We'll be back in two weeks on December 18th. We'll have a report on loneliness and look at some of the medical frontiers that athletes are creating. And we'll also have a special Christmas treat for you, so be sure to join us in two weeks from tonight. I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Twyla Young. Good night.